Welcome to Worship with Messiah Online. We're glad that you're with us today as we worship our Lord together. Just one brief announcement before we get into worship. Coming up is our MFAM show of Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. It opens this coming weekend, and then we'll have three shows again the weekend after that. I know you don't want to miss this show, so make sure that you get online and order your tickets off of our website. With that, we'll begin worship in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh 
Let's pray. Beloved and sovereign God, through the death and resurrection of your Son, you bring us into your kingdom of justice and mercy, the kingdom where your love reigns. By your Spirit, give us your wisdom so that we love our neighbors and treasure the life that is possible for us through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. We have two readings today. The first reading is from Psalm 104, beginning with the first verse and then picking up at the tenth verse. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. He makes springs pour water into the ravines. It flows between the mountains. They give water to all the beasts of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. The birds of the sky nest by the waters. They sing among the branches. He waters the mountains from his upper chambers. The land is satisfied by the fruit of his work. He makes grass grow for the cattle and plants for people to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth. Wine that gladdens human hearts, oil to make their faces shine, and bread that sustains their hearts. The trees of the Lord are well watered, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. There the birds make their nests, the stork has its home in the junipers. That's the end of that first reading. We'll continue with the reading from Matthew chapter 13, beginning at the 31st verse. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked through all the dough. That's the end of the reading. I was an orphan lost at the fall Running away when I'd hear you call Father, you worked your way. I had no righteousness of my own. I had no right to draw near your throne. But Father, you loved me still. And in love before you laid the world's foundation. You predestined to adopt me as your own You have raised me up so high above my station I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone You left your home to seek out the lost You knew the great and terrible cost but Jesus, your face was set. I worked my fingers down to the bone, but nothing I did could ever atone. But Jesus, you paid my debt. And by your blood, I have redemption and salvation. Lord, you die, then I might reap with you have so and you rose that I might be a new creation I am born again by grace and grace alone I was in darkness all of my life I never knew the day from the night but spirits you made me see I swore I knew the way on my own A head full of rocks, a heart made of stone But spirits, you moved in me 
And at your touch my sleeping spirit was awakened On my darkened heart the light of Christ to show Called into a kingdom that cannot be shaken Heaven citizen by grace and grace alone so I'll stand in faith by grace and grace alone. I will run the race by grace and grace alone. I will slay my sins by grace and grace alone. I will reach the end by grace and grace alone. Jesus' disciples asked him why he taught using parables, and Jesus replied, The knowledge of the secrets of heaven have been given to you, but not to them. He went on to quote this passage from Isaiah chapter 6, Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not understand. This has baffled readers of Matthew chapter 13, and for that matter, Isaiah chapter 6, for centuries. Why would God bother to send Jesus, Jesus go on this three-year teaching ministry, and then be intentionally vague or confusing? Now hold that thought, because we're going to come back to that. Two weeks ago, we started a new series called Tangible, based on Jesus' parables. Some of us can probably name some of the better known parables, like the prodigal son, the rich man and Lazarus, the parable of the sower, or the good Samaritan. Bible scholars have identified 38 New Testament passages that they consider parables. Could you name all 38 of them? Yeah, I couldn't name them all off the top of my head either. I'd have to look that up. But those Bible scholars, those Bible scholars who've identified these 38 parables tend to identify them or sort them into two categories. The first one is stories, or the fancy word for that is now narratives, on the one hand, or then similes or metaphors on the other. And the stories are told to make a point in some way, perhaps by giving an example of the kind of behavior that exemplifies living in God's kingdom. Then there are the shorter sayings, the similes or metaphors, which often compare two things that seem not to be alike and then tell us something about the kingdom of God. They might include sayings like, you are the light of the world, or I'm sending you out like sheep in the midst of wolves, or comparing new and old wineskins, or like the passage we read today, comparing a tiny seed to a large tree. This series is called Tangible because the parables give us some practical advice using real world or tangible examples about what it means to live in God's kingdom. In each of Matthew, Mark, and Luke's Gospels, Jesus' disciples ask him why he teaches in parables. And his answers in each of those Gospels could be read as saying, so that the wrong people don't understand what I'm talking about. To come back to the question that I started with, does that make any sense? Would Jesus be intentionally trying to confuse people? Brian Stiller, who's, who was formerly the president of Tyndale University, Tyndale University, I did not know this was hard to say, Tyndale University College and Seminary explains what Jesus meant this way. He says, Jesus' ministry, especially his preaching, was intended to invite people to join him in launching and bringing about the kingdom of God, what Matthew calls the kingdom of heaven. We could also think of the kingdom as the reign of God or God's values being lived out in the world. 
while teaching in parables using stories and short sayings was common, Jesus' parables were unique. They almost always had some kind of surprise ending or a twist that wasn't at all what his audience was expecting, something unusual. The surprise or the twist told people something about the kingdom of God. Now, the surprise or the twist would not reinforce with his listeners existing religious biases. It would instead challenge them. And it was the challenge or the surprise ending or the twist that people might resist. Some people would resist the twist. People who thought they knew how the stories should end or what these two things had or didn't have in common with each other might refuse to hear what Jesus was saying. They might simply refuse to get it. And understanding the parables does require some work. If you don't work at it, it's easy to end up not understanding what Jesus was talking about. It's easy to resist the twist. For the people who reject Jesus' message and His offer of life lived in God's kingdom, like, for example, many of the religious leaders of His day, the parables could end up as a judge. The more someone rejects Jesus' insights, His claims, His offer of new life, His teaching about the kingdom, the more someone would become unable to understand Him. And in that sense, their hearts were hardened. Though they heard the words, they didn't understand. Like, for example, someone may not have understood Someone may not have understood what Jesus meant when he said that the kingdom of heaven, also known as the kingdom of God, is like a mustard seed or like a bit of yeast. Both of these short parables tell the story of something small and hidden that eventually becomes great. And they tell us an important, vital truth about God's kingdom. A humble beginning and an almost secret presence aren't inconsistent with a great and a glorious conclusion. The focus in these two short parables isn't really on the smallness or the insignificance of the present circumstance or the beginning point the tiny mustard seed or the little bit of yeast. And the focus also isn't really on the great growth that is coming, that the mustard seed will produce a tree big enough for birds to perch in its branches, or that the yeast will get worked all the way through the dough. The focus isn't even on the fact that biblical imagery for yeast often means evil, but here, for some reason... Jesus uses the metaphor of yeast as a good thing. No, the focus is on the juxtaposition of two incongruent or seemingly inconsistent facts. The contrast between something tiny and what it grows into. A tiny little seed into a great big plant. A little bit of yeast into a big loaf of bread And the size of the loaf, big enough to feed 100 or 150 people, gives us a view of God's abundance, God's extravagance. The experience of Jesus' followers in Matthew 13, a small group of of devoted disciples together with a larger but still relatively small group of followers, is being compared to the promise of what the kingdom of God could, and Jesus tells us will, what the kingdom of God will become. God is at work in the world all the time. These parables are an invitation to expand our theological imaginations, to think bigger, to think bigger so that we can see what God is at work doing in the world, what God is up to, 
even when it may not be obvious unless we're looking for it. The kingdom of God is sometimes obscure and without much apparent influence. Jesus began with 12 close male disciples plus some unknown number of women. They counted them separately or sometimes only counted the men in those days. And, some, and sometimes there were large crowds of what we might call uncommitted listeners. It's not a big start. By Good Friday, Jesus was down to a handful of followers, men and women, at the cross as he was crucified. But not much later, Peter was preaching to a large crowd and 3,000 people came to faith. And for the last 2,000 years, the size of the church and the number of people living in the kingdom, which are not necessarily the same thing, has shifted and grown, has spread around the world. More importantly, what matters isn't the beginning. What matters is the end. The kingdom began as this small group of Jesus' followers. We can debate how well it's done since then, how well it's doing today, for that matter. We should consider whether people attending our churches or claiming to be Christians are living in the kingdom, are living by God's values today or not. But the success of God's kingdom is divine destiny. I've read the end of the book. It says that God wins, which means that God's love wins. God's values win. Yeast leavens the whole lump of dough. A little mustard seed can become a big tree. And God's kingdom, where love prevails, will someday become the measure of all things. Bible scholar Eugene Boring points out that both the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the yeast give us supernatural and surprising not just natural and expected endings. The big tree growing from a tiny mustard seed might remind you of a picture you've seen of a farmer with a a gigantic tomato or pumpkin strapped to the back of his flatbed truck. Boring suggests that this one lone woman working with that massive amount of flour is either crazy or working in God's bakery. A modern analogy to these parables might be, the kingdom of heaven is like a preacher who preached every Sunday to a little congregation of 25 people. The preacher kept on preaching until the whole city of 5 million people believed the gospel and lived changed lives in which they loved their neighbors and worked for the kingdom. These parables of Jesus undermined people's preconceived ideas of how God would work and how God still works in the world today to bring in the kingdom. So far as Jesus' original listeners could observe, the kingdom was a tiny little garden herb. The future tree, big enough for birds to rest in its branches, was surrealistically unnatural to them. These parables aren't about the natural progress of the kingdom from tiny and almost invisible to huge and glorious. The tiny seed and the yeast were shocking symbols for the coming of God's anointed king. Christians today sometimes sometimes respond just a bit too smugly to ancient Judaism's rejection of Jesus because Jesus didn't conform to their images of what the Messiah would look like and what he would do. Nobody expected the coming kingdom to be led by a man who was crucified on a cross by the Roman Empire. Perhaps we can learn from the parables 
not to have fixed ideas or images about what God at work in the world bringing the kingdom looks like. We need to be open to the possibility that the presence of God's kingdom at work in the world today may not fit our ideas of how and where God's kingdom is supposed to be present. The church, with a big C, has often throughout history read itself triumphantly into Jesus' parables. We like to picture ourselves as the small seed that grows into a large tree, or the little bit of yeast that will fill the entire loaf. But the parables are about the kingdom, not about the church. In order for us to grasp the meaning of these parables, we have to not resist the twist, not read our cultural or other assumptions into the story. We have to not assume that the parables are about us. Instead, they're about God's kingdom. Theologian Karl Broughton points out that in Lutheran theology, thought, and ethics, we understand that God uses both the government and the church. If and when they get it right, the government provides safety and order, and the church advances both the gospel of salvation and the message of loving God and loving one another. But there's a big if and when on that idea. That's if and when the government and the church are both serving the values of God's kingdom. We shouldn't assume that either the government or the church has always been on the right side. The parables speak of the final victory of the kingdom, of God's values prevailing. That victory will come despite present circumstances, whether in first century Palestine or 21st century Southern California. And Jesus' parables challenge us to respond to their message rather than simply seeing them as a guarantee of our own success. These two short parables tell us that the true nature of things is not obvious. First century Jews were waiting for a political or military messiah to come and defeat the Romans. They didn't recognize Jesus bringing the kingdom because he wasn't doing what they expected. Today, we are encouraged by our culture to think in terms of the physical world that is right in front of us. We don't recognize the spiritual world, or even the importance of spirituality, perhaps, because it's not physically right in front of us. And we may not recognize God at work in the world when God's values benefit someone other than ourselves. Jesus set out to fracture, to break into and disrupt the idea that life as it is, is the same as life as it should be or life as it will be, if we don't resist the twist. Jesus' teaching can shift our attention to life as it could be and life as it should be. Jesus alters our perception, expands our awareness, and ultimately changes our lives and our behavior. Jesus rejects the default setting of our ordinary consciousness where we are tempted to accept the world as it is, as a given. Instead, Jesus asks us to have a theological imagination that sees the possibility for living by God's values in this world, which would, of course, change the world and change the people around us. So Jesus asks us to give up our allegiance to life as it is and instead to seek God's reign, God's values, God's kingdom 
here on earth in our lives. We can live by our own values, which unfortunately include our own pride and self-centeredness, or we can live by love. We can live by the values of a God who sent His Son into the world to go to the cross because He loves us, because He loves you and your neighbors so much. And the values of a God who calls us to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. As a response to hearing God's word, let's recite our faith using the words of the historic Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now for our love moment, we'll have a short video about our coffee project. Hi, I'm Tony Hill with The Coffee Project. Our dedicated volunteers provide both organic teas and coffees to everyone who loves such things. We are partnered through Equal Exchange and Lutheran World Relief to provide the small farmer collectives who produce these fine products with a decent wage. Please join us the first weekend of every month for sales. Thanks to Tony Hill for organizing our coffee project, and thanks to you for supporting it. The coffee project sells equal exchange coffee and tea, which is supported by many churches and buys from small local coffee farmers in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the United States. Personally, I love that I can buy whole bean decaf coffee, which is getting harder and harder to find. But we have it here at Messiah. You can buy coffee the first Sunday of the month and the first Monday of the month at our Monday morning food drop-off. Know that your weekly offerings, your general fund giving, makes possible our support of all of our related ministries, including Equal Exchange Coffee. To make a financial contribution to Messiah, you can mail a check to the church office or bring a check to our Monday morning food drop-off, or you can make a donation online using our app, our website, messiahyl.com, or your own online banking. Thanks for all of your support for Messiah's ministry of loving God and loving one another. Now please join me in prayer. Abundant God, we give you thanks that you provide for us all that we need, including a fruitful earth which, prov which produces all that we need for life. Bless those who work in the field. Grant favorable weather to all engaged in agriculture. And help us to ensure that all people share the fruits of the earth and rejoice in your goodness. Help us to see the world through your eyes so that we see your abundance and the possibilities that you provide for us. Help us to see you at work in the world and to join in working for your kingdom, your values in and with our lives. Give us faith to trust you even when we when we feel small, and give us the vision to see both all that you have for us in this life and all that you would have us do in service to our neighbors. We ask all this for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Now, Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and with mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord with joy. Thanks be to God.